everyone. Welcome to our event, Woven Encounters, Orientalism and Fabrics from Medieval to Modern Popular Fiction. Um, I'm Eleanor Myerson. And I'm Pauline Swanban. And we're going to be discussing these themes in our different research. So for me, that's medieval romance and culture. And for me, it's the 18th century to early 20th century um, popular romance genre. And I guess I've been fascinated by fabrics or in particular soft textures for a while because they've been the most prominent ways of defining the East and at the same time conveying romance and sensuality. I feel like it's it's a hist- has a history of its own and that's why I've become fascinated with seeing any more background history from Eleanor's work as well. Mm. And I, for my part, uh, am really looking forward to seeing how these motifs that are fairly prevalent in my own research, seeing how these motifs develop uh, after after the Reformation, after the rise of the British Empire, these huge political, economic, cultural, religious shifts that that happen um, after my research ends, really. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to our conversation, uh, and I hope I hope you enjoy it as well. Definitely. So yeah, please take us away. Okay. Medieval English fantasies of Eastern in quote textiles were suffused with the ideology and imagery of the Crusades. Luxurious fabrics were originally brought back from the Holy Land by crusaders and were subsequently traded by merchants and pilgrims. The crusading associations of imported silks continued to inflect their interpretation long after the collapse of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, so the last Christian settlements fell in 1291. These items travelled between cultural and religious contexts, their meanings shifting along their journeys. In 1977, an excavation in Oldgate, East London, uncovered a scrap of silk woven with Arabic text, which you can see here on the slide, from the 14th century site of the Holy Trinity Priory. The fragment is from a magnificent priest's vestment. In 2019, I visited the Museum of London Archives, when it was still possible to do so, where I was able to see the fabric for myself. The repeated Kufic motif and the plant ornamentation belong to a school of incised twills, mostly made in Syria around 1000 CE. The damaged lettering can be read either as Allah, God, or Baraka, blessing. The style of this lettering is characteristic of workshops in Al-Andalus, uh, so suggesting that these fabrics were made in Spanish workshops which were highly influenced by Syrian designs and crafts. This fabric conjures scenes of medieval priests performing their ceremonies in silks which foregrounded their Islamic origins, perhaps surprising given the popular conception of the medieval period. The use of these silks in an East London monastery can be read within this context of crusading nostalgia the Arabic text repossessed for Christian ownership as the Holy Land was desired to be repossessed for settlement, a futile desire, I might add, given the dominance of the Mamluk Empire in this period. The fabric is both foreign and domesticated, simultaneously Christian and other. The complex spiritual associations of Arabic silks are a common theme then in medieval romance, in the late 14th century Breton Lay Emery, an imaginative sense of the East pervades the tale in explicit connection to a wonderful cloth of gold eventually belonging to the narrative's heroine. In many ways, this imagined silk extends the narratives legible in the inscribed surface of the Old Gate fragments. These spiritually inflected fabrics simultaneously invite and exceed commodification. In Emery, we first see a cloth being woven by the emir's daughter of, I quote, heathenness, for her beloved, the son of the Sultan of Babylon. Term Babylon here refers to Cairo. The Christian king of Sicily then wins the cloth with mastery and with might. The gown is looted, 
the product of the emir's daughter's artistry displaced to Christian ownership in a clear evocation of crusading conflict. Emery's father, Artius, the emperor of an unspecified Christian land, then receives the cloth as a gift from the king of Sicily. Artius has the cloth cut into a dress for his daughter, Emery. The gown on Emery's body frames her in its otherworldly quality. The emperor, it is said, let shape a robe quickly of that cloth of gold, and when it was done her upon, she seemed none earthly woman. The non earthly quality of the gown resonates with supernatural otherness, a foreign magic. The reception of the cloth as other in European contexts is repeated. When Emery refuses to sleep with her father, he casts her out to sea on a rudderless boat. Uh, a motif I identify as the silk clad heroine making her getaway on a raft image. Um, so this manuscript image, hopefully you can see on the screen, but if not, it shows a heroine in a silken silvery gown and her nude father wearing a crown swimming behind her on a, on a raft from a manuscript of Christine de Pizan's City of Ladies. So not, not describing Amore, but a similar image. Um, in Emery, the robe protects the heroine, guiding her to safety on the Welsh coast. On her miraculous arrival in Wales, again, we are told that, I quote, the cloth upon her shone so bright when she was therein in dight, she seemed an unearthly thing. The visible alterity of the cloth is a source of fear to the Welsh queen, who cries that she is a fiend in this wordy weed. The use of wordy is a variant northern spelling of worthy, referring to the value of the dress, its economic quality. However, it is hard not to read more into the chosen term. The gown is, after all, wordy, a complex text covered in stories which recall its eastern origins. Emery's integration into Welsh society is so successful that she marries the king, but her mother-in-law conspires against her and she is once more cast out to sea. Again, Emery is protected by her robe. Lying on the planks of a raft now drifting away from Wales, Emery buries her face in her sleeves. Her surcoat that was large and wide, therewith her visage she can hide. The details of the cut of Emery's sleeves recalls the historical presence of imported silks in medieval England, such as those excavated in Oldgate. This robe is not simply drawn from fantasy, but also from proximate observation. The gown is exterior to Emery, a surface which contains properties not inherent in Emery herself. The gown appears to be a willing guest, a non-Christian stranger in the Christian narrative. If the power of the gown is other, it is a foreigner which acts as a talisman for the Christian heroine, who herself is receptive to its origins. Emery is a heroine who has been brought up with imported knowledge of silk making. As a child, Emery was cared for by her nurse, Abro, who taught her golden silk for to sew. The name Abro implies corrupted Arabic. The transmission of artistry between Abro and Arab Emery represents cross-cultural interruption as a form of nurturing care. In teaching Emery to produce silk work, Abro provides her with her primary character trait. It is through this skill that Emery sustains herself throughout her travels. When she arrives in Wales, she ingratiates herself by teaching the Welsh to sew and mark all manner of silken work. Emery's silk work is a marker of her civility, assuring the Welsh of her respectability. It is a civility directly learned through contact with Islamic culture. When the robe next brings Emery safely to Rome, her silk work again saves her from torment. Harboured by the rich merchant Jordan and his wife, Emery passes seven years sewing silk work in Bower. Emery appears in sympathetic parallel relation to the distant Emir's daughter who first made the cloth. Her commitment and respect to both imported materials and imported skills is proved through her actions, which become all the more essential in her own exile. Although the movement of the gown between cultural contexts is first the product of Christian violence, the transmission of silk making around the globe is shown as the prerogative of immigrant women who bring the threads 
of Arabic learning with them as they move. An alternative narrative of diasporic silks and of women artists forging global contacts through travelled materials runs simultaneous to the previous apparent simplicity of conflict. When Emery wears the looted gown, she simultaneously displays the spoils of religious war and an outward marker of her affinity with the world of silkwork. These journeys of the gown, from Egypt to Sicily to Wales to Rome, follow the historical global movements of silks, transported during the Crusades, preserved over dangerous seas, treasured in Europe. As David Jacobi has commented, the popularised term Silk Road is a simplification. There was never a single continuous route. There were always multiple routes and multiple centres, including but not limited to Damascus, Antioch, Baghdad, Venice, Genoa, Florence, Milan, Cyprus, Al-Andalus. In Emory, Arabic Lent techniques spread around the world at the same time as Arabic cloths looted from the east to Sicily. The Orientalist binary was not yet the totalising geographic division. Emery herself praised to arrive at land not from east to west, but by north or by south. Silks in Emery are the combined product of fantasy and observation, exoticism and contact. The influence of the Islamic world is at once foregrounded and rejected, desired and feared. The tale is an inseparable mesh of contradictions, which do not cancel each other out, but remain in an easy, continued juxtaposition. In many ways, medieval silks were liminal objects, balanced between here and elsewhere, where elsewhere was both an idea and a reality, the fabricated Orient, the lost world of the crusading settlements, and the vivid witness scenes of dialogue in the Mediterranean. Amazing, thanks Elena. And I really like the idea of silks being a balance between here and elsewhere and representing idea, reality, especially this concept of the fabricated Orient, um, which I definitely see being seeing more of in the 18th century, the fake and the fashionable Orient as well. And in particular, I think this is when beautiful textiles become a popular motif for building, interpreting or defining the opposing other world um, and a way of expressing love, sensuality and romance. So the first European translation of the Arabian Nights Entertainment by Antoine Galland in 1704 to 1712 inaugurated a mania for Oriental stories where the translated were made up. I'm quoting from Robert Owen's very comprehensive Companion to the Nights. A few years earlier, Galland also co-created the less famous Bibliothèque Orientale, which was described as the first encyclopedia of Islam and really introduced several writers to this field, especially the French fairy tale writer Charles Perrault. Um, so Oriental tales definitely flourished alongside fairy tales. And Charles Perrault was definitely an admirer of Bibliothèque Orientale, and both his and Galland's works were discussed in literary salons. And when The Nights was published, it inspired a flurry of imitations, satires and parodies, many of which were very eroticized, and the imagery of fabric tying them all together. And of course, Galland wasn't the only source. He was, as I quote from Owen again, was only part of a wider fashion for chinoiserie, turquery, oriental silks and ceramics, and the architectural follies in the Egyptian or Chinese mode. The increased consumption of opium in the 18th century seems to have gone hand in hand with an interest in oriental imagery. The Orient were consumed as part of everyday content and was particularly connected with, embedded in the pleasurable domestic, leisurely feminine reading, such as in the ladies magazine, for example, which ran from 1770 to 1847 and featured lots of different types of oriental tales interwoven with other sentimental stories, letters, translations, and recipes. So intriguing clothes were an immediate marker of the impressive, intimidating, and tempting oriental world and man. In Elizabeth Marsh's The Female Captive, an autobiographical account of the author's time held captive in Morocco in 1756. She describes at length her encounter with Sidi Muhammad, the future sultan of the time. The story is filled with sexual danger as the prince continues to propose to her, but not without sly consideration of his luxurious attire. 
The detail she uses is meant to shock the reader into the reality of his situation. It seems to acknowledge its own exaggerated nature. Historian Linda Coley and, um, remarks that Marsh wrote many versions of her story, choosing obviously to publish the most dramatic one to be popular. And as she writes and describes, he was dressed in a loose robe of fine muslin with a train of at least two yards on the floor and under that was a pink satin vest buttoned with diamonds. He had a small cap of the same satin at his, as his vest with a diamond button. He wore bracelets on his legs and slippers wrought with gold. His figure, altogether, was rather agreeable and his address polite and easy. So this type of encounter really seeps into popular mass culture, especially prominent in the desert romance trend during the interwar years which was ignited by a novel called The Shake in 1919. It was a very popular novel that was made into a Hollywood silent film in 1921 starring Rudolf Valentino. The story is about a young woman who is kidnapped in Algeria by a violent sheikh, but eventually falls in love with him. Diana, the heroine, is confronted with the sinister plushness of the sheikh's clothes and his tent. And she describes him tall and broad shouldered, dressed in white flowing, flowing robes, a waistcoat embroidered in black and silver. And this appeal comes from the confusing contrast between his robust masculine form and foreign garment, which appears effeminate in its embellishments and sweeping shape. The novel ends with racial ambiguities, and it's later revealed as that the Sheikh is actually of European heritage. So among many complexities, his, his ethnicity is considered a lifestyle choice and his clothes a costume. In the novel, fabrics highlight how the Orient is seen as materially rich but morally impoverished with terms such as lavish sumptuousness, unrestrained indulgence, especially barbaric splendor and barbaric luxury. As the romance progresses, Diana's body gradually reflects her surroundings. It softens and succumbs to her new home symbolize a very violent sexual awakening. And this is very stereotypical of other novels. The looseness of exotic fabrics also indicates a sense of freedom the heroine can only experience in the other world. And the chance for an untethered open lifestyle with movement, travel, and unashamed promiscuity. So, so fabrics is exploited, I think, as a vehicle for fantasy, otherwise impossible to express at home. So desert romances really indulge in vagueness. Silks become silky. It's a feeling, emotion, rather than the actual object. And this truly aligns with the mode of romance reading, which focus on, focuses on the pleasure of the assumed female reader and her affected body, which relaxes and reclines in tune with the heron's own positioning. And like the knights, the sheikh inspired imitations and versions, becoming a fashion of its own exaggerated and diluted, and fabric is part of the formula for this. Popular magazines at the time convey this, for example, one called My Story Weekly, which started in 1927. And this featured a lot of short adventure romances with captivity hovering as a titillating possibility, not unlike the tone in Marsh's tale. They're interlaced with advertisements for products like such as Eastern foam powder, which commodifies the Orient as an experiment to veil, put on, wear, and even protect and shield, as it says in this ad. So it's assisting with one's self-improvement. So the use of fabrics has certainly become a very simplified literary device. Um, but as you've explained, Eleanor, it's, it's become part of a mesh of contradictions. It's about this strange idea of the Orient being revered, repulsive, desirable, escapist, and many more things looped uneasily together, but I think compelling in itself, we just can't really help being drawn to it. Mm. And I think um, that was an incredible presentation. I certainly learned, learned a lot, and I'm looking forward to continuing to discuss these themes with you, Pauline. Um, it's a shame that this is a short event. I feel like we've uh, scratched the surface of what could be a much longer conversation. And I think we'd both like to invite uh, any listeners to get in touch and share your own encounters with fabrics 
obviously there's a big gap between mine and Pauline's research so I think we're both keen to find out what exactly goes on between 1500 and the 18th century uh, but also in the periods which we have covered we haven't aimed to give coverage um, and yeah I think we'd both be fascinated to hear more from from our listeners. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's not even really an unveiling for me. I think it's just been a little <laughs> shimmering tease. Mm. Of um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really enriching. And yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing anybody else's thoughts.